welcome to the Museum of the City of New York. Uh, my name is Fran Rosenfeld, and I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the museum. Uh, thanks so much for joining us for tonight's program, Dwelling in the Future, Imagining Tomorrow's City. Uh, tonight's event is the fifth and final program in our series, Housing Tomorrow's City, which accompanies the museum's Future City Lab. And that's our interactive multimedia third gallery of our ongoing exhibition, New York at its Core. Events in this series have tac tackled different aspects of housing, and in including New York's housing crisis, head on as leading thinkers, designers, architects, and activists explored innovative ideas and shared their work to consider the future of housing in the city and in making a home in the city. I really would like to thank particularly our series supporters, Sophia and Peter J. Volandis. We are so grateful um, for their support. And just wanna to mention, tonight's program is being filmed, as you can see, by the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Tonight's event is a, a, all about considering how New Yorkers might inhabit and experience the city several generations from now. Um, and we're departing a little from our strict focus on housing that we've had for the rest of the series and just going wider and thinking um, a little more broadly about how people are gonna live and experience the city, including, including where they're gonna live. And right now, uh, Kay is gonna come up to the podium and I'll just tell you that Kay A. Dilde is senior edit editor at citylab.com. She's lived and worked as a journalist in the United States, North Africa, and Europe and held staff positions at many media organizations, including the New York Times and Essence Magazine. Uh, won't you please join me giving her a warm welcome. Well, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here, and we at City Lab are very excited to be co-presenting this panel with the Museum of the City of New York. And this has always been one of my favorite museums, so I feel very honored. And I feel very fortunate to be on a panel with such uh, interesting and illustrious panelists. So we are the final program in the Museum's Housing Tomorrow City series, and we're building on the possibilities imagined in the, in the museum's future city lab. Like all cities, New York is a work in progress, but since its founding, it has always been the site of inequality, where some people live well and others barely live. Our panels tonight are people who imagine a different and better future. A future in which people self-govern, not in the way we do now, but in community-based restorative ways. A future in which we live in homes that support the natural world and integrate with it. A future in which we harness artificial intelligence and technology innovation to create more equitable societies rather than, max than using it to maximize profit by tapping into people's private lives. A future in which a time traveler from an even more distant future will visit to find out how we manage to claw things back from the abyss and redistribute, redistribute wealth, reclaim health, rejuvenate the environment, and learn to love, live, and flourish in harmony with each other and with New York City. So I'm going to tell you, introduce the panelists briefly uh, all at once, and you can figure out who is <laughs> who, which I'm sure they will tell you. But I'll do them in the order in which they're going to come up. Our first panelist is Mitchell, jo Mitchell Joachim. He's the co-founder of the architecture, urban design research, and consulting group Terraform One and an associate professor at NYU. He's an apt person to be on this panel as he won the History Channel and Infinity Design Excellence Award for the City of the Future. And I'm not sure if he'll talk about it today, but his team's innovations include homes they call fab tree habs, meat homes, and butterfly sanctuaries. Our second speaker will be Sam Miller. His book, The Art of Starving, won a Best Book of the Year Award from NPR, and his most recent book, Blackfish City, which we are fortunate enough to hear an excerpt from tonight, has been cited as one of the best climate books of the year. But he also takes on the future of artificial intelligence and gender in the book. By day, Sam is a community organizer in New York City, or he has been until very recently, and part of that will incorporate into his presentation. Alex Gerber is a design researcher who works with people to visualize and enact the futures. Right now, that means designing public services and inventing civic experiences that stretch and define our beliefs and values. This panel is suited to her work as she wants to provoke discussion around how our society could be more equitable and more, thought and more thoughtful and meaningful. Ayo Kumsunde is an artist, designer, educator, and time traveler. 
who reclaim spaces for underrepresented communities with the use of technology, ritual, and the speculative. You may have seen him as Dr. Tiny Mowo, a scientist from the future world walking the streets of Harlem to analyze, document, and experience our contemporary society. Or you may have seen him teaching at Parson. <laughs> Thank you very much, and I'm pleased and excited to introduce Mitchell Joachim, our first presenter. Okay, great. It's, uh, it's amazing to be here at the Museum of the City of New York. It is also one of my favorite museums. That's my name. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to talk about some of the work that we do in Brooklyn, New York. We run a 501c3 nonprofit urban design architecture think tank that works on wicked ideas that affect cities in the long term. So we don't try and do things that are necessarily easy to solve or for, you know, for, you know, some kind of financial gain, but to, to deal with problems such as climate change uh, that are, seem to be so difficult and affect so many sectors, waste, food, water, energy, air quality, mobility, et cetera. So our team of researchers tackle problems, uh, sometimes with success, many times you know, not so successful, and, uh, and work on the idea of the speculative or future city. So uh, I'm just gonna show a few projects that uh, you know, run around this new notion, which is our uh, idea about dealing with one of the most wicked problems you can find, which is the idea that wildlife population since the 70s has been reduced in half, some say even more than 60% of everything on this planet, bird, fish, insect, mammal of whatever kind has died. Uh, actually, every seven minutes we lose another species on this planet, which is just impossible to fathom uh, how terrible that is. And architects, urban designers, and uh, certainly uh, developers and their clients are complicit. Not that we are inherently bad people, we are certainly not. We are not a group as is. We just go through business as usual and try to get through these problems, but we need to do more. We've got to do way more. This is uh, one of the things that inspired some of our work, which is the, the loss of the white rhino. Uh, there's now two left. The last of any kind of a species is called an endling. Uh, it's absolutely terrible. We're going to lose uh, a, a different species of giraffe. My kids will never see some of the creatures that I'm going to show in the future, and it's, it's just ridiculous. Uh, uh, so what do we do as architects, urban designers, planners, et cetera, this entire field to stop something like this? Well, we have metrics and charts and ways of prefiguring into our designs when we come to thinking about the materials and the embodied energy uh, in, the, in the built environment, we use these kinds of uh, point systems. Uh, so lead, energy, star, bream, et cetera. And if you look at all of them, I don't know if there's a laser here, yeah. If you look at all of them, that calculates everything that goes into a building, but if you combine every single one of these point systems from all over the world, less than 5% of those points comes from biodiversity. So less than 5% of the points you would get would be for saving necessarily some creature that might be at the edge of extinction. That's not under some protection, which uh, the red list doesn't necessarily protect you, and there are all sorts of issues behind something like that. So our, our work is simply under this single uh, overriding predicate, which is design against extinction. We could do it. We can make an effort. One of the biggest problems is that we're all in the business of population growth. We expect to have 11 billion people on this planet by the end of the century, so how are we going to live, work, and eat, and certainly design cities and places when uh, you know, we definitely will affect biodiversity? And stuff that we eat, such as meat production, is expected to double by 2050. That's all the cows, pigs, lamb, chicken, whatever we shovel down our throats uh, in these kind of mass-produced ways of farming is probably not the best way to deal with uh, the environment. Now, it doesn't mean that uh, you shouldn't have a stake if, for those who like it. I want a world, and I'm not trying to change behavior. I, we don't think like that, but we do need to think in a way that makes sense for the Earth's metabolism especially uh, when it comes to moving around in our streets. So again, we've got more stuff in our streets than ever before. So how do you think of all of these things holistically? I mean, who even does that? So we, we attempt to do it, uh, and we get so far, and it's meant to be a polemic. So we have others join us, it's not just us, to come in and argue and come up with ideas for future neighborhoods and speculate about what it would be like if we can get to a better place. Not a perfect place, not utopia. Doesn't, 
necessarily concern me, utopia, but getting to a better place is important. So we call it socio-ecological design. This is sort of how we do it. We've got teams of people from poets to teachers to firemen to urban planners, all of us coming together working on the project of the city. There's no such thing as a stupid question. In fact, sometimes those questions actually lead to you know, new roads of research. So some of the things that I'm going to talk about are in these ideas about how we move and eat and live in the future city. One of the projects I did getting my doctorates at MIT was thinking about the future of mobility in cities in the Smart Cities Group under William Mitchell. So one, uh, here's a project we called the Hug and Kiss uh, Soft Car. It's a car that's essentially uh, uh, omnidirectional shared ownership model type vehicle. So you don't own it, you kind of, you log in, you get into your car and you move throughout the city and you move in organic flocks and herds, call it gentle congestion. You can read while you're driving. The car doesn't go faster than 30 miles an hour because if you do go faster than 30 miles an hour in New York, it seems super fast and it is. Uh, the cars are designed to be scuffable, so it's okay to bump up against other cars. It's kind of the point. And if you do rub up against another car, well, I guess if you do that in LA, people get really violent and guns are involved, et cetera. New York, uh, you know, in this type of future, we look at the person across the way and you know, say, smile, chow, move on your way. You can imagine that ever happening in New York. Uh, someone stole my cab in the rain yesterday. It was like, oh, I want to, I'm still angry for some reason. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so it led to 14 years of work led to this, which is the Heroku. So you go from speculation and ideas about the future city. This is a car that spins on a dime, drives by wire as a shared ownership model, and is all about parking because it stands up, reducing its footprint. So you can get about 300 of these on a New York City block parked as opposed to 30 SUVs. So research is really important to do up front, but to get something to be productized takes a long time. And we speculate about what the future city would be like if we look at all of these models about mobility and incorporate them with ideas of vertical farms with some level, you know, some automation or some modicum of, of uh, taking care of them and maintenance and then replacing streets with great civic kind of landscapes and riparian corridors and then having trackless trains inside there moving high throughput amounts of, of, of individuals and then vertical access wind turbines and solar panels for independent lighting grids, et cetera. All of these things visualized here in a kind of rebooted 42nd Street. And uh, stuff about, well, if that's not about movement in the city itself, it's about what you eat. So this was our client for some time, uh, this guy, a bug, and the goal was to eat him and lots of him. Why? Because the United Nations in around 2013 said that we can't live of all, off of all of those kind of cows, pigs, and chickens that we consume. So can we start eating insects in Europe and America? And I, Still, you know, not convinced until we did this project. So why would you want to eat a bug in the first place? Well, you save around 2,000 gallons worth of water compared to a cow and roughly 300 times less carbon emissions from eating insects. Although I do not necessarily want to eat the bugs themselves. Uh, we actually mill them into a powder and turn them into bonbons, pasta, uh, bagels. They're actually kosher. Uh, all kinds of foods that are an alternate form of protein. So this is a comparison of what it takes in 100 acres to make the same gram of protein versus crickets inside a city. So this is rural areas with cows, livestock, and this is cricket farms inside cities. So you go from pasture to plate really quickly. So here are the crickets that we are producing to be turned into a powder. Uh, this is our shelter and farm that we had uh, produced in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. It's got 320 bio units. Each one produces a bag of chips. They die after six weeks of life. So we don't kill them, we let them live out their life naturally. They roam through the entire kind of colony. And then after reproducing, et cetera, when they get really big and fat and old, and they sort of, then we, we begin to eat them. These, these crickets here are, um, <laughs> they're model crickets, so they're just there for scale. They did not escape. They're not, a meant to, they're not meant to get outside the shelter, but they're inside the system. We have a patent on this technology for harvesting the crickets. They move throughout the shelter. It's expandable. It's built inside cities on rooftops, uh, empty uh, you know, kind of park spaces, wherever you might find them. And the whole system is naturally ventilated through these vibrating columns of air that run through the center of each one of these uh, uh, pod systems. And then they move outside the wind cowls on the top that are turned into instruments that magnify the sound of the crickets chirping. 
What did crickets chirping mean? To us, it meant our client was happy. It essentially means um, the males are super horny. They move their wings back and forth to find females, and they essentially do. And when you hear lots of males chirping, it means they're everyone's getting it on and they're producing lots of babies and they feel really comfortable, they like where they are and they, li they live and prosper in that colony. Uh, we produce these things called sex pods, which is a way of encouraging the females to go into these sort of dark little spaces to meet males, give them their kind of come hither looks. I don't know what crickets do um, in cricket mating. I don't, but it works. So they, they have lots of sex in that thing and it took some time to figure it out. All right, so off from you know, bug sex, we, we're working on farms that you have inside your home. This is called the Plugged Ecology. It's a rotegrity sphere that's, sphere that's robotically milled. Uh, it could be any size, comes flat packed from four feet to 18 feet in diameter. Instead of a green wall, it's a green ball. All these ple pleated structures you put inside different kinds of foods that you'd wanna eat, such as spirulina, or high yield crops that you wanna have access to immediately and enjoy personally, so you have some connection between the food on your plate and where it's grown. You can hang out inside it or triple your sort of production by growing food on the inside. Uh, this is showing you the outside of the pod where it's grow uh, lights, et cetera, get stuff on the bottom. We also do cellular agronomy inside those little folds so you can grow food from test tubes as opposed to from seeds or saplings. And then the last project that I'm gonna show, because we only got a few minutes, uh, is called the Monarch Sanctuary. So here's a creature that is becoming extinct. It's endangered according to the US Wildlife and uh, Fishing Services. Uh, it's a beautiful butterfly that's on the edge of life. We've lost over a billion since uh, the 90s. My kids won't see the monarch butterfly. We decide to integrate a sanctuary into the facade of a building that we're doing in Lolita. So inside this double skin is places for chrysilli, caterpillar nurseries, and uh, milkweed that thrive inside the skin of that building. It goes in through the double skin up to the top where there's an education center, a pollinator garden to learn about butterflies, certainly what's happening to them, atrium spaces through the center, and all these areas where butterflies can thrive and live. This is an elevation showing you on the outside of the facade, we project uh, the kind of drama that's happening inside with the butterflies, so because you can't really tell from far away, but people will go, what's going on in that building? And they'll see giant butterflies outside and think it's slightly weird, but they'll move closer and they'll find out, wow, it's a sanctuary for butterflies that are on the edge of extinction. Why is that? What can we do to stop it? We'll plant some milkweed, stop uh, you know, removing it from gardens everywhere and think about ways you can save these creatures from oblivion and other things you should be saving. Because design against extinction happens to mean that we also will be extinct if we don't save these creatures. So we did, uh, we had some grants from BASF and Intel. These are some of the full scale uh, uh, um, kind of operations we've been working on when it comes to the facade, how to feed butterflies, how to service them, and how to work with materials that have a logic and a sensibility and meet the standards and code for New York. So we worked with a different type of concrete to make uh, areas for uh, feeding them with nectar, areas for uh, moss to grow, uh, areas for, they like mud pits, butterflies. We did everything we can to make butterflies happy. So all of these here are systems for uh, a fly ash impregnated um, concrete that we use with BASF. It's super green, low embodied energy, is, can fits in a, in, a, in a eight story building in New York. These are some of the early prototypes. That is the uh, initial renderings. And then I'm gonna end on the final image of this is the monarch butterflies inside the double skin facade. It's on display now, right down the street at the Cooper Hewitt, uh, at the design triennial. You could see our project where we did a full scale mock-up of this double skin facade that is entirely made as a biome for monarch butterflies to survive. They can go in and outside of the building. It's a way station, so they can breed inside there, but they're not meant to live there entirely, and they're meant to be a part of the wild population themselves. So this is uh, showing the different feeders and the different mud ports. This is the monarchs inside uh, that double skin facade. When you have an office inside that building, when you look out your window, you see this incredible garden with monarchs thriving and having lots of fun. So that's just some of our projects, and thank you very much for listening. Thanks, guys. Uh, my name is Sam, um, and I'm a science fiction writer, and if you um, see any 
short stories or novels for me in the near future with a urban cricket farm uh, at the Brooklyn Naval Yards. Uh, that's not plagiarism. It was set in a public event. I, I, that's amazing. Um, so, so as Kay mentioned in, in uh, my bio, um, for the past 15 years, I've been a community organizer uh, with Picture the Homeless, in addition to, to being a science fiction writer. And so uh, I want to speak a little bit about my process as a science fiction writer and how that's sort of connected to my organizing work. Because both science fiction and community organizing and activism are really about the things that we love and the things that we hate about uh, the world and, and trying to imagine them uh, being being better. Um, so to tell you a little bit about my novel Blackfish City, uh, it is set in a, uh, you know, maybe nearer future than we would like where rising sea levels have transformed the globe and uh, there is a floating city in the Arctic uh, where a woman arrives with a killer whale and a polar bear on a mission of bloody revenge, of course, as the best missions are. Um, and so even though this is set in a floating city in the Arctic a hundred or two or, you know, ten years from now, um, it, it is very much about New York City and, and my feelings about New York. And uh, this book was selected uh, by the Van Allen Institute, which is an urban planning think tank, uh, to be their book club selection. And so I was invited... And by I was invited, I mean I begged to come to the uh, to the meeting where they talked about it. And uh, yeah, these urban planners saw right through me. And not only did they know all the different New York things that I was talking about, they even one of them even figured out the ex city council member who I was uh, making fun of uh, with the useless the useless politician character. Um, in the book. Um, so I'm going to read a short excerpt um, from the book. Um, and th from 15 years of organizing and going on a lot of meetings with politicians and sitting down with homeless folks who were asking for a really specific policy change or uh, introduction of legislation, uh, really smart folks who uh, had gone through like a collective process of saying, what are the problems that we're dealing with? How can we fix them? And who has the power to make them? Uh, and so had gone to city council members and, and legislators and senators to say, we want you to do this. Uh, and every time it was like talking to a robot because they always said, I can't do that, uh, even though we knew that they actually could. Um, so in Blackfish City, uh, government is all robotic. Uh, it's all artificial intelligence is running everything. So I'm going to read a short excerpt. City Hall, they called it at first, the early arrivals who still remembered the old models of municipal governance, mayors and city councils, legislative and executive branches administered by frail and earnest humans. Their mandate was to create a system of computer programs that could do the work of government better than humans could. Something invincible, immune to bribery or bigotry, knee-jerk decisions or politically motivated ones, Robots that would make the right call regardless of whether it was an election year or a sex scandal was about to be exposed or a waste treatment center had to go in a rich part of town. The nickname stuck, as in you can't fight City Hall. Of course, everyone knew it was bullshit. Programs can only be as objective as they're coded to be. I have them gathered here, the ones who created the network and the ones who maintained and updated and repaired it. I hold the memories of programmers, bit mechanics, legacy surgeons. I've seen the swirling sets of conflicting priorities. We've seen it get up to some pretty spooky stuff. They could do anything, these machines, these gins, this mind, to preserve the status quo. They could let a problem get worse to distract from another pro problem. That's how the shareholders set it up. Every city is a war. A thousand fights being fought between a hundred groups. Rich, poor, old, young, born here and not born here. The followers of this god and the followers of that one. Someone will have the upper hand in each of these battles. Those people will make the rules, whether they're administered by priests or soldiers or politicians or programs. Fixing this is hard. Put new people in power, write new laws, erase old ones, build cities out of nothingness, but the wars remain. The underlying conflicts are unaffected. Only power shifts the scales, and people build power only when they come together, when they find in each other the strength to stop being afraid. Money is a mind, the oldest artificial intelligence. Its prime directives are simple, its programming endlessly creative. Humans obey it unthinkingly, with cheerful alacrity. 
Like a virus, it doesn't care if it kills its host. Money will simply flow on to someone new to control them as well. City Hall, the collective of artificial intelligences, is a framework of programs constructed around a single, never explicitly stated purpose to keep money safe. What would it take to rival something so powerful? What kind of mind would be required to triumph over this monstrosity? What combination of technology and biology, hope and sickness? How can we who have nothing but the immense, magnificent, tiny, powerless spark of our own singular self harness that energy, magnify it, make it into something that can stand beside these invisible giants, these artificial intelligences, weighty legal words on parchment, and the glimmering ones and zeros of code in a processor somewhere? You scoff. You say the idea is hopeless fantasy. But I have found a way. Stories are where we find ourselves, where we find the others who are like us. Gather enough stories, and soon you're not alone. You are an army. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, in my sort of science fiction process of imagining this future city and, and, uh, and how that relates to community organizing, uh, it really is rooted in what do we love and what do we hate? And, and what, what are the problems of the city? What are the things that make us furious? What are the, you know, the, the slideshow that we just saw um, from Mitchell, uh, you know, thinking about climate uh, and thinking about extinction and thinking about um, all the ways in which we're making this world so much worse. Uh, that's, it's really easy to get overwhelmed by that. It's really easy to get very angry about that kind of stuff. Um, with working on community organizing issues, especially around homelessness where the, oppression is just of such an unspeakable magnitude and, and people are dealing with such horrific oppression on, on an everyday basis, it's really easy to get, um, uh, to feel helpless. And so with organizing, as with science fiction, I really wanted to imagine how can, how will things get better? It's, it's really easy to imagine how things will get worse. And a lot of people talk about Blackfish City as a dystopia because it's in a post-climate change future where Hundreds of millions of people have died because of uh, wars and conflicts over resources. Um, and I think that uh, the interesting thing about thinking about dystopia and this idea we have about a future that will be miserable and terrible um, is that it's dystopia now. It's dystopia for a lot of people. Uh, a, a lot of people are living really wretched lives, whether they are kids in cages who've been separated from their families at the border, or homeless folks in New York City, um, or people who've been mass incarcerated, or people who are uh, living in uh, parts of the world who are already being even more severely impacted by climate change than we are here. Um, and it's also a utopia for somebody. It, it's a utopia for people who uh, live good lives and don't have to think about these things yet and who are continuing to make really bad decisions and refusing to take the action that's needed um, to fix uh, uh, the, the problems that we're facing. Um, and I think that that's been true at pretty much every point in human history, right? It's been dystopia for someone uh, and utopia for someone else, and usually it's dystopia for a lot more people than it's utopia. Um, so, so as I'm writing and as I'm imagining uh, a future, I want to think about how things that are things that are bad will get worse, but some things can be fixed, and we can fix some problems. And so, um, you know, maybe we can get rid of corrupt, evil politicians and replace them with robots that will actually do a slightly better job than humans do. Um, one of the things that uh, I've worked on at Picture the Homeless is police reform and looking at the ways that the police violate the rights of homeless folks and how that connects to the broader uh, fight in the United States around uh, police racism and, and police brutality against people of color. Uh, and the one thing that I was sort of looking at is the... Uh, in sort of thinking, trying to think of uh, in a visionary way is looking at other places around the world. And there's a city in Finland where the police are all mental health professionals um, and 99% of their job is uh, going out and speaking to folks who uh, are dealing with substance abuse issues who have fallen asleep in the snow and who will die if they don't get to a warm place. Um, so there's parts of the world where uh, the city functions just fine without a brutal racist police force force to maintain a brutal racist status quo. Um, so in closing, I'll just say that uh, science fiction for me is a tool by which I can hope for a better future, but also talk about the things that I hate about our present. And uh, I think that uh, 
just like the, the sort of uh, uh, presentation we already saw and the, the work that folks are, are doing, uh, that's, you know, I'm just sitting at a typewriter or a computer when I'm making this crazy shit happen. Um, but the other folks who are going to talk are actually making monarch uh, habitats happen and doing much harder, more interesting, more visionary work. Um, so in closing, I'll just say that uh, the, we can take that sort of like anger and that hope and the things that we love uh, can be what we uh, what motivate us to fight for uh, a future that looks less miserable than the one we kind of feel in our gut we're about to get. Hi, Sam, I think you set up my, what I'm going to talk about really well. So I'm Alex, and here's another slide of my name. Um, as Kay said, I'm a design researcher, and I've most recently been living in St. Louis, Missouri, and teaching at Washington University. Um, but before that, I lived here in New York, and I was a graduate student at Parsons. And I want to talk briefly about a project that I've been working on in St. Louis that builds off of some of the work I started here in New York. So as we were just talking about, um, we have a problem with policing in the US. And we know that biased policing targets people of color, responding with unnecessary force, treating innocent people as if they're criminals, and not taking their needs and victimization seriously. Um, these are not failures of the system, but this is the system working as it was designed to protect wealth and power from harm. Yet when I've asked people here in New York and in Ferguson, Missouri, to imagine a world without policing, this is what I hear, um, that if there's no cops, there would be chaos, and without order, there's chaos. I see this as a closure of imagination, um, and people have been forced to rely on policing, and on this idea of order for safety and protection, even when they um, have to endure targeted uh, harassment as a side effect. So while we could send officers to anti-bias training and ask them to participate in basketball games on the street, it won't change this underlying mission to create order by force. So I'm a design researcher, and I build on participatory and critical design practices I'm not an expert in criminal justice or policing, but I'm very interested in how we can work together to open this closed imagination and to push against the status quo and recenter the goals of those who are hurt by the criminal justice system today. So I went, when I moved to St. Louis, I began to look for a group who was already working on thinking about policing differently, and I found the Neighborhood Policing Steering Committee in Ferguson, um, which we call the NPSC. And it's an open public group involved in the reform process mandated by the US Department of Justice after the 2014 uprising. So I've been participating as, as a regular member for the past two and a half years, um, working on how to involve residents' perspectives in community policing policies that are being developed by the Ferguson Police Department. And alongside this work, I created a project called Futures of Public Safety to try to open our imagination beyond just fixing problems to reconsidering what we want from public safety kind of at the core. And uh, with this project, we started with a booth at a NPSC hosted block party, asking Ferguson residents how they would want to keep people safe if we didn't have policing at all. And we asked about specific scenarios, like what if you witness an act of domestic violence in this world without policing, what would happen next? Or what if you're driving over the speed limit? Um, and instead of focusing on people's immediate answers, we tried to understand the underlying values of the systems they imagined. So throughout the responses we heard, three future visions kind of emerged. And I made those tangible by building these three scenes with artifacts from the future um, that imagined what it would be like in those worlds. And these scenes are meant to be a constant work in progress. They're props to gather around as we debate the kind of future that we want. It's important to me that I don't create or show one singular vision, um, because seeing many possibilities is what allows us to compare and see the benefits and limitations of each. So as I mentioned, each scene imagines an ideological shift. In one of the, in one of the scenes, which is called uh, the future of public service, it uh, prioritizes healing trauma rather than this idea of order. 
And this idea, this comes from ideas like this one that we heard at the block party, which is about um, that someone committing violence needs counseling during and after the violence because they believe that the person is coming from somewhere and it has its source, um, something that happened in childhood. So in this, um, you could imagine if there were no more police officers in New York City and instead we rely on the Department of Social Services to make sure people get the services they need to prevent and recover from harm. Um, and in this future of public service, each resident has a risk profile um, with the Department of Social Services. And we can see that it has uh, some basic information about them, like their age, their family, uh, their home address. And there's also um, this risk prediction for different things like antisocial behavior, drug abuse, violence. And that's determined by these factors at the bottom, like few living relatives, adverse childhood experiences, um, and diagnosed trauma. So, um, and this actually builds on predictive policing risk analysis tools that are currently used in New York and also other cities like Chicago and LA. So looking at this, you might be thinking, you know, wait a minute, that's not, um, I don't know if that's the future that I wanna live in. Um, and that's on purpose. Um, all of these artifacts are meant to be props for a conversation, so they incorporate both positive and negative implications. And they're not meant to be proposals for things we should produce, but rather provocations about what could be if we prioritize a different set of values. So for example, if we focus on healing trauma and preventing harm rather than enforcing order, social workers would probably want to be sure that they're getting services to the people who need it most as early as possible. And on one hand, that sounds great. Um, instead of letting things progress to a violent altercation, people would receive care and healing when they need it. On the other hand, how does the government get all of this information about people? And what if someone doesn't want the therapeutic services that are offered to them? Since this is focused on the time before a crime is committed, would innocent people be forced to undergo therapy based on an algorithm's assessment of what they need? So we could zoom out and look at another scene. And the future of grassroots cooperation um, com comes from comments about how we can't rely on government to keep people safe. So instead of healing trauma, it's focused on building community power. And this comes from ideas like members of the community can help people get to the root of the problem through community conversation. But we also heard things like, um, I don't think a thief deserves death, but in the heat of the moment, if I'm in my house and I see someone stealing from me, he might get shot if I'm having a bad day. Um, so these ideas led to a vision of a world where kids might grow up with, this, with protector scouts, where they might practice mediation and community networking, but also use of firearms to keep their neighborhoods safe. And this is an example of how multiple people's ideas can be put into conversation with each other in one designed artifact. So the goal um, is that they, their props uh, with, these, with these artifacts is that they're props in an iterative process when people can see um, their own or other people's visions um, in uh, kind of made tangible and then they can react and get more specific about what they want to see in the future. So I think um, my vision of New York City's future is just for everyone to have the opportunity to participate in, in a creative democracy where there's healthy debate about a multiplicity of different ideas um, and where ideas about fundamental ideological change can be taken seriously and explored. Um, yeah, explored. Thank you. Okay, hello. Uh, my name is Ayo Damala Tanimo Kusende. Um, you could just call me Ayo. Thank you for having us here. This is great. It's um, wonderful to hear what everybody has um, to say. Um, my background is um, I'm, a de I'm a designer. Um, I went to Parsons um, at the DT program and um, I create these sort of speculative projects. Um, this is a piece that I wear and I come from the future as an astronaut to the present and I sort of observe and make records. Um, I wear this around the city. Um, I've even worn this to um, jury duty. Um, I did not get selected. 
Um, so I teach, um, I have a creative practice, but I also have a commercial practice, and um, it's called Universal Solvent Studios, and my creative partner on that is here today. So with this um, studio, her name is Yvette King, um, with this studio, we do um, besp bespoke projects like this, um, medium-sized projects. Um, so this is a piece by Wina Lin, and it's about um, um, e-waste. Um, and then we also do gigantic projects like this um, for Pia Week. Um, this piece sort of analyzes small um, animals and then takes the data from that and puts it into uh, an algorithm, AI algorithm that controls um, um, cancer cells and does crazy things. Um, but all of this to say that in terms of the way that we work, we think we like to think about ourselves uh, as following a certain um, design process. So thinking about design as something as an interface with the future. For example, if you want to create a chair, you know you sort of think about the what the type of chair you want to create, and you create it, and then now you've interfaced with the future. And it's a very practical um, process. But what happens when the problem that you're trying to solve is too big, you know, so Mitchell was talking about wicked problems, you know, and these are problems that we try to sort of think about and address ourselves. So, for example, um, if you think about um, pollution, think about overpopulation, um, think about climate change, how do you address these um, issues? So, one way that we try to do that is sort of think about the future in the sort of future cones way. Um, things that are probable, um, most probably likely to happen, and we try to push that into spaces that are preferable for us. So thinking about this in terms of jumping into the future, finding a problem, finding the solution for it in the future, and then bringing that solution back to the present as a way for people to sort of contemplate that, um, um, th that problem. So the idea is not necessarily to practically solve the problem, right, because the problem could change over time, but to allow people to think of a different way of understanding the problem and hopefully change its trajectory. Um, this could be applied to also going into the past as well. So we apply this at Universal Solving Studios to our commercial stuff, to our pedagogy and teaching, and um, to our artistic practice. And we open up our studio for students to um, sort of experiment. This is a piece um, that talks about the tomato and uh, products, um, native um, foods from the Americas and colonization. Um, this piece is about sugar and diabetes. This is a piece about um, sort of thinking about how do you capture food and not just by taking photographs of it or by um, having recipes, but actually things that surround the food, like the friends that you're with, the feelings that you have. Um, this piece over here by Ashley um, is about a future where, uh, a Caribbean future where there are no mangoes left. And she tells this story um, through an audio piece and through this. And then um, this piece, Expelled, um, posits that um, Donald Trump um, asks all people of color to get off the planet. And then you have to think about, okay, if you're an African or um, or if you're Peruvian, what type of foods would you take? And these are some of those um, products. So all these pieces sort of contemplate the future or, or, or ways of um, sort of thinking about the future and creating artifacts um, of that future. And our reliance on um, imported foods and commodities um, that is so unrelated to our geography and to the seasons. And being humans, we have this sort of um, we have a, we're kind of fickle, and um, yeah, we don't have an idea of where our food comes from. We don't have an idea of how to, you know, if we see a, a fruit that's bruised or some fruit that's ugly, we tend to just, instead of eat it, we tend to just throw it out. So there's this massive, massive amount of food waste. And then also we have inequality. Um, this is a poverty map of New York. So you have the haves and the have-nots, and then, so this also further atomizes the populace, and then you have um, neighborhoods where you have no access to food at all. You have um, food, food deserts. So we started thinking about what are some of, the, some of the solutions that people might have. There is the practice of freeganism, um, where you 
to try to eliminate food waste, you take food that people have thrown out and you, and you utilize that. Um, you have organizations like City Harvest that collect food for the um, for lower income um, people. You have organizations like Ed Edible Brooklyn that sort of talk about food culture and um, and yeah, basically talk about food culture. One one of the things to keep in mind here is that there's this um, dichotomy or this break between the people that have food um, or the people that have access to food and that or and people that don't right so we want to consider ways to gain, give more give more accessibility to sort of even that that um, that that field so in New York we have like a whole bunch of um, gardens community gardens and community farms but there's also the practice of of foraging, um, and we believe that foraging could be something that's very useful in the future to sort of supplement um, some um, one's um, food intake. Some of the most difficult conversations about ed edible um, resources, edible food resources, require changing our expectations of what and how we eat. Uh, many natural local food sources are not commercially vi viable because um, they're not suitable for commercial harvest, or they require a really intensive preparation, or um, they require intensive preparation for consumption. Um, we have recipes that are basically delivered and prepackaged um, at our doorstep. And food as, as labor is an idea that, we're no, that we can no longer recognize. We expect food to be easy. Um, and we expect it to be available and consistent. So we wanted to figure out how could we sort of work on that. So we developed this project called Forage Beacon. And Forage Beacon, we wanted it to be a data-rich um, project, something that's educational, speculative, but y useful as well. Um, and we envision a, a suite or a number of um, beacons that sort of tell you um, where you could harvest food, and they sort of communicate with each other. So it has a, um, it's about eight foot tall, um, soil quality sensors, air quality sensors, solar cell, and they create a mesh network, and it has a beacon on top that sort of indicates um, the quality of the soil and what's forageable, and it has um, aluminum plates that um, have um, the, the pro produce is forageable in that local area. And you, it creates this network so you can see if you're on this network over here, you can, you can hop, hop onto it and you can see what's happening over here. Um, you can see who else is in, your, in the network at the time. So this allows you to collect data on um, not only the allows you to collect data not only on the air quality and, and soil quality, but also analyze those, that data. Um, it, it's live, um, and it, it gives you information about local um, and um, remote locations. So this is um, our prototype. Uh, we did this for the um, Amalentia. And this is um, on top of the, uh, the garden on top of our studio. And you can see here, um, I'm so happy that it has a laser. Uh, green means yes, that's good to forage. Red means no, stop. Um, so the beacon here um, changes color. And the, uh, you have different colors. So you could program the, um, these to mean different things, but generally red would mean that there's soil contaminant. Um, green means go ahead and forage, but you could also see that you have other people in the network. And then it tells you you could hop on to get more information about the plants that are in the local area. Um, this is a mock-up of um, the interface, um, the node that we have. So basically, you with a Wi-Fi enabled device, you could walk up to this, um, um, to this beacon, you could hop onto it, and then you could input information, or you could get information about um, about that area. So um, these are some uh, some extra um, panels that we've um, engraved on a, this, I think, 24 by 12 inch uh, aluminum panel, and this is what it looks like. 
So keep in mind that this is not necessarily for you to, this isn't all the information about um, this, uh, about Amelanchia or service variants, right? It's really just to start a conversation um, because number one, the plants are, plants are really hard to identify. So we don't expect this to be the BN and end all of the identification or um, you also need to know how to, um, pr how to e e eat the food, right? So by logging on to the um, beacon, it will tell you how to prepare the food. We don't want people eating um, psychedelic mushrooms. Um, or maybe we do, who knows? Um, and also plants change over the season. So this is a, a service, service berry um, and it's red, right? And you can't, for example, see over here, there's some flowers, but it's not necessarily, you can't really see how detailed that is. So like I said, this is just a proposal for people to see this beacon, gain more interest in it, and then find out more information and educate themselves. And finally, um, this little fellow over here, um, he's eat, he or she is eating service berries. Um, this could be you. You know, this could be you, this could be you. Uh, let's just not leave this for the birds. So feel free to go out there, gain information, forage, um, and if you find our beacons, um, hop onto them and you know, send us some information. Thank you. So one of the themes that really stuck out at me was uh, something that you mentioned, Sam, which was about artificial intelligence and, and about frail humans, about uh, robots who think of humans as frail and weak, and that they are making decisions about uh, what is best for us. So I was thinking about that in, relevant, in our relationship to what you are working on, Mitchell. I was wondering how you make decisions about your projects, and you said that the cricket project, that was something that came from the United Nations about uh, that, that we were eating too many animals, but that crickets might be something that was more sustainable. But then I wondered how you came to the monarch butterfly, like what, how you chose that species. I mean, that's a really good question because we actually picked uh, a creature that um, frankly is very attractive, has got really good branding already, has really accessible, is out there, is native to New York, is, is, is highly known. And I, I think that that becomes a kind of the, sort of the poster species for extinction. Uh, it was sort of a, a low hanging fruit because a lot of us can relate to the monarch butterfly and uh, you know the millions of other species that are uh, you know, not as quote, elegant, which is, you know, who's saying what's elegant or not, but some crazy little lizard or all types of insects or some toad or, you know, no one cares, or even the more <laughs> less attractive mammals with strange foreheads and, and um, spiny ears or whatever, they, there's not, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going off on a tangent. We picked it because it clearly, it, it's something that we can relate to and, and out front really sends the, the appropriate semiotic pulse so that our signaling is clear and that we can move from that species to other species. We would love to get into all other kinds of you know, uh, uh, creatures, which we certainly will work towards, but we need things that become the kind of the, the clarion call to the problem itself. And the monarch was, uh, un un unfortunately, it's, it is red-listed and, and uh, you know, just something that would be uh, easier to grasp as far as to save. A little bit building on that. Alex and Sam. So, Sam, you, as artificial intelligence or something that figures in your book and with these robots and your work with the homeless, how do you uh, picture a scenario where people who are homeless, who some people or perhaps robots might think don't contribute at all to society, how do we think about how to protect them? Or whether uh, you envision a world where people might not think, or robots may not think they need protecting. And then also, Alex, I was wondering how you're able to bring that population into your work when you have these, uh, these um, sort of um, scenarios that you're building out, that you're incorporating uh, people's viewpoints into. How do you get a population that is very difficult to reach? You know, after working with homeless folks for 15 years, uh, 
I mean, the thing about homeless folks is they are people, and that they are, they have all the wisdom and power and strength and knowledge and, and senses of humor uh, that everyone else has. Uh, and so, for, for me, um, the spoiler alert for pretty much everything I've ever written is that people save themselves and that people fight and win and when people come together to fix things, they can really accomplish anything. And that when we look at, if we sort of look at the vector of human um, progress, uh, it, is, it is like the, the significant changes don't come from the top, they come from the bottom and they come from people fighting for things like a weekend or the fact that children don't have to uh, uh, work uh, uh, and that people don't have to be slaves. Uh, so I think that um, for me that's the real inspiration. I, I don't typically, um, as a science fiction writer or as an activist, sort of look to technology or future, you know, you know aliens, robots, whatever, to sort of solve the problems. It's 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 people who are going to solve them if we get out of their way. Which right now, um, you know, there's lots of ways in which we get in the way of people to solve their own problems. But I think that. Um, it's on, it's on us to sort of figure out how we can sort of step back and, and deconstruct some of the systemic barriers to people exerting their power. And I think in terms of how I've gotten people involved in, in the work that I've been doing, um, it's, been, it's actually been really difficult to do that in some ways where it's like, uh, I think a lot of times people are, um, they don't wanna spend time on thinking about so far in the future that it feels like it's not going to make change right now. Um, and so, yeah. But I think one of the things that I've figured out um, to make it easier is to just find people where they are already doing that. So um, here in New York, I started working with a group at Exodus Transitional Community in, in Harlem, and um, people were there, um, well, on probation, so the young people had to be there um, thinking about about these things, and I was able to do some projects with them around imagining um, different futures. And in Ferguson, um, finding that group, the Neighborhood Policing Steering Committee, where people are already thinking about how policing can be different and just acting as a participant in that space has been a really important thing for me to, um, to see what's already happening and what people are thinking about, and then just to participate in moving that conversation in different ways. So Aya, while you were speaking, I was thinking about foraging, and I was thinking about um, having been recently in Chinatown, and there's a lot of people there who forage and then sell what they forage, some of what they foraged on the street. And I was wondering, what do you see that will be different in the way children are taught? Do you think that will be taught that our children, or our children many times in the future, will be taught to forage, or that will be part of what they learn in school, how to access food in different places will become like reading, writing, arithmetic. It's really important to understand that this, the project or the, um, the output of um, this process isn't necessarily to say that this is what's going to be, right? But it's to allow people to think, to, for them to think about the present, right? And to think about how do we address issues of food in inequality, right? So, but if one says, okay, there is this, um, that foraging is something that can, that is positive and might be useful in the future, then one has to start thinking about the, um, the different complications that, you know, so for, for example, it's not legal to forage in public um, parks, right? And that's for a reason, is because it's, uh, these are protected areas. So then one can start thinking about, um, you know, how do you protect an area, right? How do you educate people to say that, okay, if you're gonna forage, you know, don't just grab everything, you know, leave something for somebody else. Um, how could you say to people, don't just grab everything and then sell it off, right? And s sell the food, um, because there might be somebody else that, you know, might, might need it. So I think thinking about it in terms of opening a dialogue about, the different issues um, surrounding forage and, and surrounding food waste and surrounding food access would be the primary, you know, that would be what, um, in terms of education, that would be what should be taught. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.